Okay. Uh, and I'll turn things over to team 434F. So good morning. Thank you so much for joining us, Team 434F Shaker Schmakers, as we present our shaker table, the ADAPT table. We're a team of seven motivated mechanical engineering students, Lisa Aberg, Alex Hadid, Alexis Hernandez, Patricio Miranda, Joseph Neighbors, David Norton, and Kristen Centinello. We put lots of hard work and hours into this project, and we're excited to share our senior design with you. For our presentation, we'll be going over our design overview in detail, as well as our testing results and cost analysis. We encourage questions, but ask that you please hold them until the end of the presentation. So um, for this um, project, our team decided what we're best at, what we're most passionate about, and what drives our economic engine to find the shared goal of creating a safe, easy to use, and low cost design with many options for shaking speeds and patterns. Thus, the ADAPT table was born, or rather designed and manufactured. Our design includes five main subsystems, which are the table, frame, shake, base, and control panel subsystems. Next slide. In the early stages of our product table design, we based the design to have simple mechanism of thumb screws coming from the acrylic sidewalls that had a flat surface and a T holder at the middle of the acrylic table to attach and hold in place both the test tubes and the well plates by using pressure force coming from the two directions of the thumb screws. We encountered a few issues in our first table design. The most important issue was that we did not contemplate the addition of the ODFI device to be placed underneath the table to cast light into the well plates and test tube. Hence, for our second iteration of our design, we added a metal plate underneath the acrylic table to place the ODFI device. A 30 millimeter clearance from the acrylic tabletop to the metal ODFI table was made using, uh, using metal spacers in each corner. The acrylic sidewalls were removed in the second iteration as we figured that acrylic will not have enough strength to hold the force being applied by holding down the well plates and test tubes with the thumb screws. As we removed them, we came up with a different method to hold down the test tubes and well plates. We designed acrylic L brackets. They use wing nuts and bolt heads that hold, that hold down the test tubes and well plates. Um, to the correct uh, position where it wraps around the test tubes and well plates and push it to the L corners into the middle of the plate. We switch from T holder in the middle to L corners, mainly for manufacturing purposes as the change was beneficial to use as a typical uh, acrylic uh, size uh, may be found rather than a bigger one. Um, next slide. Uh, when prototyping our design, we decided to increase the thickness of the L brackets and L corners from six millimeters to 12 millimeters uh, to assure the secureness of the test tubes and well plates from the shaking movement. Um, key features that our table design provides is the availability to hold down the uh, two table tubes or two well plates or one of each simultaneously. As the L brackets are adjustable depending on the test tube or well plate, it provides the design to be adaptable in case the user chooses to use a different size for the test tubes or well plates. Also, as seen in the red circle in the left, with the use of a head bolt in the slotted rail for the L brackets, there's no need of a wrench or, a, or any other tool to tie the L brackets into place. The metal, uh, the metal spacers separate the acrylic tabletop and ODFI metal plate to have a 30 millimeter clearance as stated uh, before, uh, that gives enough room to place or remove the ODF5 uh, device with ease. And in case the ODF5 changes in height, uh, the clearance makes the availability to use many other versions of the ODF5 device. Next slide. So now talking about our frame subsystem, our original design from our first iteration, was a three rail design using rails from IGUS and carriages from IGUS. Uh, these were, we had two base rails that, that controlled, that allowed movement in the Y direction. And then a rail on top of those rails allowed movement in the X, X direction. These were mounted to four leveling legs, or self leveling legs. 
And then moving on from that to MS2, we yeah, kept our, our three rail design, a lot of the same with two base rails and one upper rail, but we changed it to have more stability by mounting these rails directly to the base plate, allowing for more contact and allowing us for ease of manufacturing and, and lower a lower height so there's less wobble. Now from, from MS2, click. Sorry. From MS2 uh, to our current model, we had a lot of changes you can see. We went from a two base rail system to one base rail. Now this was mainly by an issue of binding. Now the two base rails were over constraining our system. And that was due to the base plate not being perfectly manufactured with any slight issue in the holes being drilled for the parallel rails. It would, it would just cause an unbelievable amount of friction, allowing just the rails not to move and the, the motor would just be struggling to, to give it a little push. So we moved to a one base rail design and we kept the upper rail the same, just shortened it a little bit due to not needing the entire length from subtracting the one rail at the base. So it was a pretty easy fix for us. We, we took our base plate, we drilled two new holes that were in line with the, the shaft of the motor and the, the clevis rod. And this fixed our design, or helped our design a lot. It was, it made it more compact. It was a lot easier for us to just, it was quick. It was a, it was a one day fix for us. And it, it decreased the amount of friction by a lot. We were able to have the motors push it in full contact. It was a lot less binding. There's theoretically no binding for us. The, the carriages, were a lot more smooth in movement and it made our also it made our design a lot more lightweight as well. So moving on to our shake subsystem, this is the subsystem where the motors are, it consists of the motors and how they're connected to our shaker table. So in early stages, we actually started off with a scotch oak design to convert our rotational motion to our linear motion for both the X and Y directions. Um, however, at the time, we had one motor that was um, mounted to the ground and fastened to the bottom level of rails, but our second motor was actually freely moving with the upper rail, and it was fixed to that, so we <clears throat> quickly decided that this is not what we wanted in our design, so moving on to MS2, we had both of the motors mounted to the base plate, and then additionally, we switched from the scotch oak design to a linkage design with a threaded rod and our own custom motor arms. Um, and then additionally, as you can see in the right hand photo, um, the top left corner, we added an extra rail and a guide post. Um, the extra rail was needed so that the motors would move independently of one another. And then the guide post was to keep it from moving left and right or in the axis of that other motor. Next slide. <clears throat> and then once prototyping started, there were other changes made that led us to our final design that is shown on the right-hand side. Um, for starters, we created a new longer motor arm. As you can see in the left photo, it's the black 3D printed piece. That was to be able to push both of the carriages at the same time on the bottom rails instead of um, our original design, which only pushed it on the left side. Um, this was to get rid of the moment that was created by only pushing on one side. However, as Joseph just mentioned previously, we had a lot of um, over constraining binding and friction in this design. So um, removing the bottom rail to have a center one allowed us to use our original motor arm and just push one rail. And that worked out well for us. And then additionally, we ended up changing our NEMA 17s to NEMA 23s. Um, as I'll explain further in the next slide, our motors require, um, our design requires our motors to change directions very quickly. And so our stall torque was not enough in our NEMA 17s to do what we needed it to do. So we ended up switching over to NEMA 23s, which therefore had us adjusting the motor brackets and the motor hubs accordingly. And then lastly, for changes, um, there were some slight changes to the upper motor arm and its guide block. 
Um, the upper motor arm used to be a rectangular cross-sectional area for the shaft. However, we switched it to a circular cross-sectional area so that there'd be less friction. And then the guide block used to be a U-shape and we just added a top to it to constrain it on all of its sides instead of just from left to right. Next slide. So our key feature in the shake sus subsystem is it has to do with the way that we get our orbital patterns or our shaking patterns. So instead of doing a full rotation, our motors actually oscillate back and forth between two set points. So essentially, the software calculates the total steps that the motor needs to take to get the linear distance that the user wants from their diameter input. Um, so it'll set the motors to be oscillating about position two, as you can see in the right hand picture, it'll oscillate about position two and it'll move back and forth between positions one and three. And then depending on when the user wants a smaller or larger radius, it'll move points one and three either closer or farther away from two to change that diameter of the orbitals or shaking patterns. Um, also, the motors have a full range of 30 millimeters to go back and forth from, but the software caps it out at 25 millimeters. So essentially it'll never hit position four while running a shaking pattern. That position four, as you can see, is only to get that extra distance it needs to hit the limit switches when calibrating. Next slide. So we, um, we based our shaking patterns off of these equations that you can see the green one being the linear, the blue is orbital, and the orange is double orbital. So essentially the cosine is just the motors oscillating back and forth between positions one and three. So of course for the first case linear, we have our X motor oscillating between one and three, and then our Y motor does not do anything for that pattern. And then for the um, single orbital pattern, as you can see, they both have the same motion, except the Y motor is out of phase by a quarter of it. So um, essentially the X motor starts at position one, and then the Y motor starts at position two, and then that's how they work. So they're just out of phase, and that's how we got that um, shaking pattern to work. And then for the last one, it's the same thing. They're both out of phase, but the um, the Y motor also moves half the distance. So it's positions one and three are closer together and it moves twice as fast. So the Y motor will do two oscillations while the X motor does one oscillation. And that's how we got our shaking patterns. Next slide. For the initial design of our base subsystem, we came up with the idea of mounting the rails and the carriages to the four legs directly. The idea behind this design was our uncertainty, whether or not we, a base table, a base plate table was necessary or not, and it turned out to be a viable solution for the time being that allowed the ability to change the elevation of the shake subsystem. However, the idea was scrapped due to the legs potentially not being able to withstand the vibrations that they would experience from the dual motor setup in the shake subsystem. Hence, the second iteration of the design came about utilizing C channels. Using the C channels added more stability due to the overall surface area of contact being increased since the first initial design. However, this, uh, this design was also scrapped due to the C channels experiencing a high moment from the forces experienced from the two rail setup on the bottom. Also, the team, our team decided that it was not necessary to have the shake and frame so system elevated up high. And this is where we resulted in our final design of ultimately using a base plate to mount the shake and frame system directly. Next slide, please. With our final design, some of the key features of this design are the damping feet and the large mass. The reason for the four damping feet were to help the table deal with the vibrations that will be experienced from the shake subsystem. The large mass of the base plate also adds more stability to the overall design when dealing with these vibrations. A noticeable change from the MS2 design are the additional holes that were drilled due to the emission of one of the bottom rails. This change was done due to over constraining of the system, as mentioned before in the frame, frame subsystem section. This addition greatly reduces the binding and friction that the system experiences from the carriages and the rails. Next slide, please. For the control panel subsystems, the control panel subsystem went through multiple design iterations. The team knew early in the development process that we wanted to make a simple and easy to use user interface. 
the first design saw four components in total, which had LEDs indicating different system settings and an emergency stop button. Later on, the team knew the direction they wanted to go to and then added an LCD panel and a keypad for the user to be able to input all the settings. On top of that, the LEDs were carried over to work in tangent with the LCD and also the emergency button was carried over to meet the customer requirements. Next slide, please. As for the control panel subsystems, once the concept was finalized, what we, the team did was develop a control panel that would be ergonomic to someone and to be easy to use um, when placed on the table. So the first design concept had a major error where the wiring for the LCD and the keypad did not fit so what the team ended up doing was shifting up the LCD and the keypad in order to fit the wirings. As for design two, that shows the shifted up version. Design three shows a second part being printed and added on to the second part. And it was to add the LCD, the LCD I mean the LEDs and then the emergency stop button. Now for the final iteration, they were the, both of the panels were combined in order to have all components in one place. Next slide, please. Once completed, functionality was added to the control panel. The key features being the LEDs, emergency shutdown switch, and UI. The LED uh, indicators uh, are as following. The green shows that the system is ready to run. Uh, the yellow means that the system is currently running. And red is to show that there is an error with the system. Of course, the emergency shutdown button is simply a kill switch that would be in case of emergencies or if the system becomes unresponsive. As for the user interface, uh, the first thing to highlight is that the layout of the UI is very easy to use. It is all in one place and can be seen from the main menu. Once the system is turned on, the system will auto calibrate to know its positions. So the user has no, uh, doesn't have to calibrate it at all. One thing to note is that the keypad has functions written into each button where the numbers are, of course, linked to the numbers. A is up on the menu, B is down, C is to actually recalibrate the system. So if the system was to uncalibrate itself or something would go wrong, a user has the option to manually recalibrate the system. D is to, uh, to clear the settings or the numbers. Um, and you can also put periods on the system. So the asterisk is for a period. Now the enter key is gonna be the hashtag key, which would allow you to enter a submenu or edit a field. Now, the UI also has a bunch of different features, right? The, the first being there are submenus to it. So for the shake pattern, once you hit, uh, you hit enter on the shake pattern, you're going to a submenu that would allow you to choose between the three uh, shake patterns. The other one that has a submenu would be the durations. The duration setting has a submenu because it allows you to, to choose between four units of measurements. Now, the cool thing about this is that the software is smart enough to detect any sort of measurement. If you were to put 0 0.5 hours, it would calculate the simplest unit possible and display it in the main menu. Therefore, if you were to put half an hour in the main menu, you would be going back to 30 minutes. The other thing that the menu is capable of doing is if you were to try to start the machine without filling out all the, this, the fields, it would prompt you with a warning. The red LEDs would blink, the start button would start flashing, and then you would be prompted with a dialogue warning message. The message has four options available telling you which field is empty. If you were to try to start it off, off just from the very beginning, it would give you all dialogue warnings. But if you were to forget one, then it would show it as following. The other thing is for the speed, the diameter and duration, they're all capped depending on customer needs. For the diameter, it is capped between five to uh, 25 millimeters. The speed has a cap between 25 to 350 RPMs. And the duration is from zero to two weeks. Even though you can input any number you want, the system is smart enough to detect that they, it is past its limit and will bound it accordingly. Next slide, please. So main changes made from the first iteration to the second iteration of our design were to include a keypad and LCD display, the many changes to the tabletop, 
the position of our motors, the change from this from a, sto a scotch joke to a linkage arm, and the removal of the feet for our frame system. The final design has minimal changes from the second iteration design. Mainly the changes were, it were made from the second iteration a, from prototype and testing results. The changes were the change from the parallel rails to the one rail in each direction, the redesign of the guide block and upper carriage mount arm, the switch from NEMA 17 a, motors to NEMA 23 motors, the change from a push button to a mechanic switch, and establish a design for the control panel and electronics box. Next slide. In testing our final design, the three patterns were tested at different RPMs to see how the design would hold up for longer runs. For the linear pattern, the system ran at 200 RPM for a total duration of 56 minutes. From this test, there were no failures to the system at all and nothing needed, was needed to fix. The next pattern that was tested was the orbital pattern. The system still ran at a RPM of 200, but the system ran for a total of two hours. In conclusion of this test, there, again, there were no failures from the system, which resulted in, in nothing was needed to fix. The last endurance test done was for the double orbital pattern. The system ran at 150 RPM for a total of 24 minutes. However, this test resulted in a failure in the motor connection for the lower rail and the bolts connecting the motor to the motor mount. This failure was from the retaining ring falling off, falling off, which resulted in the clevis pin rod connection coming undone. In order to fix this for future tests, the retaining, the retaining ring must be properly seated to ensure a secure connection. For the bolts coming loose, it is due to the forces from the NEMA 23 motor that the NEMA 23 motor was exerting on the carriages to move the shaker table. To fix this for future tests, the motor mounts must be swapped out for metal mounts. The reason the mounts are not metal in, during this test was due to the timing of everything and the viable solution was to use 3D printed motor mounts. Using metal mounts would add, will add more rigidity and a more secure connection when connecting the motors to the mounts. Next slide, please. This table summarizes the overall cost of building one prototype seen on the left and the unit price when mass producing a thousand tables. 12 manufactured parts required raw materials and contributed to the raw material cost. The rest of the comp components were OTS contributing to that cost. OTS parts made up 75% of the total material cost. The manufacturing cost was based on 16.65 hours of manufacturing at a rate of $26.57 for a machinist. The assembly cost was based on 44 minutes to assemble the entire table with an assembly hour, hourly rate of $15.47. The mass production cost per unit was $200, $235.84 less than the prototype cost. These savings came mainly from the OTS parts, but also from the raw materials. Like the proto, like the prototype manufacturing cost, the mass production manufacturing cost was based on paying a machinist to machine each part, thus the same cost. There could have been additional savings for mass production in manufacturing cost if cheaper manufacturing methods were found instead of having a machinist machine each part. Next slide. Why adapt table? Our table is centered around the user, allowing them to choose many different setup configurations depending on their needs. The L brackets with L slots allow the user to adjust the hold down mechanisms for a variety of sizes from smaller culture plates to large test tube racks. This allows the user to decide what type and size of specimen holder they want to use. In addition, our table can hold up to two different culture plates and or test tube racks at the same time. There is a 30 millimeter, millimeter clearance for the ODFI system, allowing the user to select anything from a smaller system to a larger one with active cooling mat. Our diameter adjustments are done via software, allowing the user to simply input their desired diameter and the code does the rest. This means no hardware is needed to be switched out and no tools are required to change the diameter, allowing it to be adjusted easily and quickly. The large LCD screen and keypad allows for information to be easily seen and inputted. The addition of warning boxes and LED indicators allow the user to know when something is wrong. 
Our table can be assembled from the ground up in less than an hour, so any maintenance requires very little disassembly time. With all of that being said, our table is very versatile and adaptable to ensure it fits whatever our customer may need. It is very easy to use to minimize setup time and maximize shaking time. Next slide, please. Thank you to our sponsors, Northrop Grumman, Cummins, Carrier, and Arigo. Next slide. That concludes our presentation. Thank you for attending. Now we will open it up for any questions. Okay, awesome. Um, any questions from our panelists? Sure, this is Rick Miles with, uh, from North of Grumman. Uh, a couple of things. Um, so uh, definitely a lot of trial and error and, and I appreciate you walking through uh, the trial and error on that. But I guess, and again, I don't know specifically what the requirements were for the class, but I, I guess I would have looked for some calculations that show me before you try a design, whether or not you thought it was going to work, right? Uh, it seemed to me that maybe you went through a little bit too much trial and error because you didn't rule out things by showing, so you talked sometimes about uh, the moment arm was too big or something like that. I, I would have liked to have seen calculations that showed me that it predicted that you were going to fail, right? Or, or you, you showed that it was a small margin of safety, and so therefore you went and tested it just to make sure whether or not it was going to work. So I think a pretty big oversight was that we chose um, a linear sleeve type uh, carriage. Um, most of them had, or there was the option of doing like a ball bearing, uh, which wouldn't have caused any sort of binding. Um, we kind of overlooked that entirely and chose a linear sleeve type carriage, which created binding. And we didn't really think about that uh, while we were designing it. And until we, you know, actually put it together and, and realized that these, these linear like sleeves could create binding um, when there was a moment put on them. And then, um, so so the cost of your table, right? Uh, a pretty pricey table there. What 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 do uh, uh, commercial shaker tables typically cost? Uh, I've I've seen some online for you know from like seven to fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. I, I I guess my my biggest question there would be whether or not you would be competitive in the marketplace if you had to go mass produce this uh, against what what's already out there. Um, and then uh, you, you mentioned a little bit about uh, the stall torque was the reason you moved from the NEMA seventeen to the the NEMA twenty three motors. Kind of the same uh, comment on on the calculations. Uh, before jumping in, did you did you go figure out what might be uh, the stall torque needed for the the motor that you were going to use? I I believe we might have, but it was a lot of the oversight as David was talking about during the the sleeve bearings that were they were not as as bearing acting as we thought they would be because we I remember we first put them on the rail and they were. They had a lot of give or a lot of push into to give it a give. So originally it was like it would work with a lot of low weight too. Like when we had the entire table off as well, uh, the Neo 17s wouldn't really have an issue pushing at at high speed. Is when we added like more and more on top of that. Okay, and and then you did those endurance tests where you you tested out your your different shaker patterns, right? Um, uh, Anything you did prior to actually just running the test to try and uh, predict life uh, on those particular uh, runs? Yeah, we had our um, endurance calculations and the factor of safety, like lifetime of the the shafts and hubs and and all, and all of that that went into this. It, the the failure we had was just with the the three D printed parts, as you can see in the. The top part, we have shop rags underneath the motor mounts because they had a lot of wobble. And that's just because we changed our NEMA 17s about like a week or so before our our FDR was due, or correct me if I'm wrong, but in that, it was just, it was very last minute of us to have to go and order motor mounts because this whole NEMA 23 was very, we, we didn't, once we 
just look at the model together is is all a lot different than in theory. But we did we did do the calculations on a lot of this stuff, and like the aluminum parts had a they they were they would have lasted the entire time. It's just the ring came off because the motor mount started to go like bend a little bit, and it just it just shot right off. It's just it put it back on. That's why we're suggesting metal motor mounts. That was the main issue with all of this because throughout our endurance testing, they just have a little bit of wobble just from the, the, the motor mounts. Okay. And then my, my final comment would just be um, on, so I read uh, beforehand the, the statement, like what y'all were working to, right? Um, so I was able to follow along in the presentation, but I, I felt like your presentation jumped too quickly into your design with explain, without uh, explaining why are we doing the design. I would have liked to have le at least had a little intro there that explained why you started throwing out ODFI um, for the common user. I, I don't know what ODFI I, I did because I read that statement ahead of time. Um, but just make sure that you got your users, uh, the, the your audience that's watching on the same page as you are on. I know y'all kind of lived with this the entire semester. So those are some of the things that sometimes from a presentation standpoint that you don't think about because you've lived it so much. Uh, other than that, great job, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, uh, questions or comments from other panelists? Yeah, this is Sean with Cummins. Um, I have a couple comments and questions, uh, and also just following off of what Rick said. Uh, yeah, I agree. It was good to have a little bit of an intro explaining, um, you know, why you're doing it. Maybe some key features for us to look out for for your project specifically, and then also a summary slide of how you met the requirements, either the functional or the must-have requirements. That's always really helpful as well. So we can easily, um, you know, compare the different projects and, and see which ones meet the, the functional requirements the best. Um, other than that, though, I thought your presentation flow was really good. All of you are really clear presenters, so that's, that's well appreciated. And your presentation was super clear as well. I did have a question relating to the testing. So on the slide, it looks like the max duration that was tested for was two hours. Um, a true uh, endurance or dur durability test typically tests at an accelerated severity to account for the durability over the total life. So I think this is a little bit what Rick was getting at as well. Um, so did you do any other testing or analysis or did you plan to do any more um, that ensures that the system can survive up to the expected, uh, I think it was five years in the requirements? I think you mentioned some calculations, but um, yeah, calculations versus physical testing can often uh, show very different results. Yeah, well, for this endurance test, we were going off the the assignment that was uh, given to us. Uh, we we went up to our the with RPM that we wanted to listen to for two hours versus the the higher RPM. Uh, yeah, I think as as you go higher and higher, there's there's more shaking. There's more stuff that can go wrong. But the, we we did this for two hours. That was our that was our cap for this this part. I know it's customer needs are supposed to go two weeks and then last five years with like you know minimal replacements. And as I was saying, a lot of the a lot of the aluminum parts were were sufficient for that. It's just the with the endurance testing, you know, there's a lot of issues in terms of the main thing came from the motor mounts being 3D printed, causing bending and and just warping. But yeah, they, we could have we could have gone more. We could have gone higher, but we just did it for like the we did it at this rate for the pure need of our motor mounts <laughs> having to survive because we didn't have backups at the time. Okay. Well, also, I do want to add to that. The other issue that we had was time. I think time was the the main problem in this factor because the thing is the rail specifically we were given like three weeks after we had ordered them. A lot of issues happened there. We lost a lot of time there that we would have used to otherwise fix these issues. Because as I said, calculation, <laughs> calculations are very different in real life. And that is true. We would have tested more and would have fixed a lot of the issues that we'd encountered, but we lost a lot of time just waiting on some parts. 
And now by the end, we had we had to prototype a bunch of parts that realistically speaking will never last. But once we order them correctly, they should in theory last. So we could never get an accurate real life scenario. Okay. Yeah, that's a good answer. Thanks for being transparent about the the running out of time. That's something that happens all the time in, in industry. Um, but yeah, just for future reference, um, durability in life, that that's typically a, a pretty hot hitting item um, with any customer that you're trying to sell to. So I think either having tests or calculations or analysis that can show um, you know, your confidence there or your plan to have confidence there just to ensure that that meets their expected requirement is, is important. Um, and then lastly, um, did your tests consider the weight of the test materials or fluids that would be supported as well? Uh, no, it didn't. We didn't. We had like the two racks on there, but we didn't have them like filled up or like the culture plates as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's also something that would be helpful to consider. Um, you know, not just the system itself, but the specific applications. You know, the density of fluids could matter, and that could really affect um, the durability of your system as well. All right. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we've got, I think, about four more minutes. Uh, so, any other questions from our panelists? Um, hi, this is Elise from Cummins. Uh, yeah, just to reiterate what everyone, Sean said, uh, very well communicated, uh, really good images and uh, explanation of your um, design process and what changes you underwent and what you, I like how you showed what you had to fix as you were building it. Um, yeah, I think uh, one question I had is, did you consider the backlash of the gears with the motors when you're, I think you said you're only changing direction instead of like full rotation. Uh, did you consider that? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, did you consider like backlash in your uh, motors? Uh, originally, yes, I believe we did. Yes, originally with the NEMA 17s, we did. Um, and in theory, they were going to work, but with the issues that we encountered, we noticed that we didn't. And then with the time management, again, the time constraints, we didn't, we weren't able to perform those same calculations for the NEMA 23s. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so that would be something for a future report, probably. Thank you, and a great team name. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So just for the um, the benefit of the video, there's um, a, a comment in chat um, to echo Elise and Rick. I also thought it was smart to walk through your design improvements. It helps to show the thought and rationale put into each design change. Good. Okay. All right. Um, any more questions from our panelists? Okay, all right. Uh, well, so see no no more questions. Uh, we'll we'll wrap it up there. Um, so, um, just for the for the panelists, um, I, I probably said this in the beginning, but I was a little flustered because I got here late. So, just a reminder that we're doing um, rubrics a little bit differently than we've done it in the past. So, in the past, it's been um, we just sent you one big Excel spreadsheet and you sent it back to me at the end with all of your individual scores. Um, this time around, we're just sending a rubric, like one rubric per group. So uh, when you get to the, the end of a session or an end of a day, you should have as many rubrics as presentations that you've sat in. Uh, and then if you could just email all those individual files to me at the end, um, I think that'll that'll make it um, easier for us um, to, to keep track of, of all the scores and where they came from. Um, so, so just a reminder for that. Um, so absent that that little piece of, of logistics, um, the other thing that I just wanted to say is um, for for this group, um, you guys went first, um, at least for, for the MEC three groups. Um, and and I, I appreciate that there's there's um, a lot of risk that comes with 
um, being the guinea pig, having to do something first. So I appreciate you guys uh, volunteering for this first Mech 3 time slot and um, kind of taking the brunt of, of us, um, you know, figuring out exactly how this is going to go um, in terms of the cadence and the protocol and the questions and um, follow on groups always have the, the benefit in, in these presentations of being able to either watch live or in video form uh, the, the presentations that go earlier. And so they can anticipate the questions and they can modify their presentation so that, um, you know, they're, they're more um, kind of ready for the questions that might be coming from the panel. So I appreciate you guys, um, you know, taking the risk and being the, the group that decided to go first, uh, because there's um, you're, you're putting yourself out there and, and potentially absorbing a lot more unexpected questions um, than, than groups that go later. So we'll definitely take that into account as we evaluate. Um, Okay, so if there are no other questions, um, we, we can wrap up a couple minutes early. Um, so I want to just thank the group for sharing your, your design with us. Uh, and we look forward to um, reading your final design report, which I think those were submitted like last night, right at 10pm. So um, we'll be evaluating them and get back to you with scores um, before grades are due. So, Okay. And Dr. Nimi says, you've survived. The pain is over. Yeah. Uh, I believe when I see it. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if the pain is actually over until they see their final grades, but um, at least the pain different, is... Different type of pain. Yeah, the, 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 this type of pain has subsided. So anyway, okay. Well, thanks, guys. Um, we appreciate all the time and effort you put in this semester. Very well done with the design. Um, and we'll follow up with you when we know the final results. Thank you. Thanks. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Well, uh, we'll uh, leave you guys the room. Let me hit the.